Welcome back, my friends, to the Nature Wanderer podcast. I'm Paul, your host, and it's good to see you again. We're going to talk about the GBBC today. What's the GBBC? It's the Great Backyard Bird Count. And you're thinking, what on earth is that? Well, it is a big deal. Happens every year, President's Day weekend. This year, it's going to be this coming weekend, which is why I want to talk about it today, February 17th through the 20th. So Friday is when you can start counting and you don't stop until Monday. No, don't panic. I'm not going to have you sitting there for 24 hours a day, four days, counting birds. No, you get to do it much less than that. Or you can do it the entire time. We'll talk a little bit about the procedure for counting the birds in a few minutes. But first, I want to get into what is this all about, the Great Backyard Bird Count. I mean, I participate in a lot of bird counts throughout the year. Christmas bird count. I just participated in that not too long ago. Um, I do a couple of other local bird counts. And then this is one of my favorites, the Great Backyard Bird Count. Every year for probably, I think it's been at least 10 years, I've been counting the birds. And not just in my backyard. I count them at nature centers, local parks, state parks, county parks, natural areas. Every year I go to a different area. Sometimes when I'm out at work, if I'm working that Friday, I will just watch out my window at work and I'll count the birds that are flying around at work. It doesn't have to be right in your backyard. And we'll talk a little bit more about procedure in a minute. Why are we counting the birds? Why on earth do we want to sit around participating in this GBBC and counting birds? What's the point? What's the sense of doing it? Well, first of all, I encourage you to do it just to enjoy watching birds, to enjoy seeing the birds. They're so fascinating. I'm always encouraging people, don't just look at your bird feeder, see a bird and say, oh, look, it's a, oh, I'm not sure. Let me grab my field guide. Then you grab your field guide. You spend like 15 minutes trying to identify it, um, looking at different cues, like what color is it, size, uh, all these different things. And you finally find it in your field guide. You stick a name on it and you lost interest. It seems that every time we stick a name on something, we're done. We've named it. We own it now. So I don't want you to do that. I want you to just enjoy watching the birds. Maybe later, after you've enjoyed watching them, then you can go back and you can name it. One of the reasons I do these counts is just to enjoy seeing the birds, watching them. But there's more to it. What we're doing is what we call citizen science. Yes, you get to become a scientist for the weekend. Now, this isn't the only citizen science project out there. There's a lot of different ones. There's Frog Watch. There's Caterpillars Count. Uh, There's just so many different citizen science programs. I also participate in Frog Watch. I participate in Nest Watch. Um, I was doing Caterpillars Counts for a little while, but I stopped doing that. The point of these citizen science programs is to help science. I mean, scientists who are studying, maybe they're studying the birds, maybe they're studying the caterpillars, frogs, whatever they're studying, they can't be everywhere. Can you imagine that? Not having a life at all. I mean, a lot of these scientists don't have life as, as it is. So, Wouldn't that be nicer if you had a whole bunch of people helping you out? Well, if you're familiar with scientific studies, a lot of times they don't have a lot of money to do these studies. So they can't hire a huge number of people to say, okay, go here and count birds. Go over there and count birds. Go here. Go everywhere. Count the birds. 
they just can't afford to do that. So they depend on volunteers. Yes, they do have volunteers that work with them year round, but then they still would love to have even more data. And that's where citizen science comes in. There's training. First of all, you get trained on how to do proper data collection. After you've been trained and you feel confident that, yes, I can count the birds. I know what species I'm seeing. I know all that I need to know about collecting data. Then you collect the data. All this data goes to a database somewhere. Scientists can get to that information whenever they need it. And it's not just one scientist. It's any scientist who is looking at the data. For instance, I did an episode not too long ago on winter bird banding. All of that data went to the banding lab. And they took that data, put it in a database, and scientists are accessing that database constantly, doing studies on different species or birds in general, or maybe an area, a region, to see how birds are doing. So... They're doing this with the help of others. And with citizen science, I mean, bird banding, I am licensed. You have to be licensed to do that. It's a very strict protocol. But with citizen science, they're depending on everyday citizens, non-scientists like you and I. Yes, I do bird banding, but I'm not a true scientist. So They're depending on us to collect data, give it to them so that they can use it. Now, is there a flaw in this? Depends on whether they get bad data, but they look at that, that not everyone knows the difference between this chickadee and this chickadee. Uh, They don't know the difference between a house sparrow or a house wren. Boy, I certainly hope most people do, but some people may not. So they take that into account and they know that there's going to be a little bit of a flaw in the data, but 90% or more is going to be accurate. So they're depending on us, the non-scientists, to collect this data so they can use it. So that's what citizen science is all about. Scientists can't be everywhere, so they depend on us. So why are we counting birds? Well, besides being beautiful, fun to watch, fun to listen to. God, I love their songs. Especially on a nice summer morning with my patio doors open. I can lay in bed and just listen to the birds waking me up in the morning at my bird feeders. I love listening to their songs. It's so beautiful. But besides that... Birds are an environmental indicator. If you recall the old stories about the canary in the coal mine, maybe you've heard that expression before. It is true. They used to, many, many years ago, before they had all this very intricate scientific instruments that measure poisons in the air, they would take a canary in a cage down into a coal mine. And they would hang the canary near to where the miners were working. They would listen to it singing or they would just look over at every once in a while. And if that canary stopped singing or if it was laying dead on the bottom of the cage, they knew time to get out. Now they don't do that anymore. Now they have all these very intricate instruments that will collect the air samples constantly, and it'll tell them if there's bad air in the mine and when to get out, and it'll let a siren go off. So no more canary in the coal mine. But that's what they did, and that's where that expression came from. Canaries are a bird. Birds are very sensitive to environmental changes. They will adjust if they can But if it's a quick environmental change, they won't be able to and their species will basically die off. They have done studies and found that certain species, their numbers have gone down. And so they know there's trouble in the environment. Maybe birds disappear from a certain region. 
there's something going on in that region that's forcing them out or killing them off. So that's why we study birds. We want to know where they are, how their populations are doing, what species are being found in different regions. They did a study many years ago. Um, they took all the data from the Audubon Christmas bird counts for, I think it was 100 years or so. They took that data and they analyzed it. And they found that quite a number of species, I believe it was 60% of all species of birds, had moved their basic territory further north. That was just amazing. It was proof that climate change is happening. It's getting warmer, and the birds know it, and so they're moving further north where the food is. They don't have to migrate as further south either. So all this was collected through citizen science, and we were able to tell, well, the scientists were able to tell, and they just told us, that things were changing in the environment. So birds are environmental indicators. We can study things like climate change by studying the birds. We can also learn more about the birds and their habitats, their natural history. We can tell where the birds nest. We can tell what birds hang out in the wintertime, what birds are migrating, what birds are not migrating. So a lot of information we can get to study the birds and to help us just by watching birds. The Great Backyard Bird Count is a citizen science project that helps us study birds. I should say it helps the scientists study birds with our help. The Great Backyard Bird Count is an effort that's put together by different organizations, not just one organization running it. Like the Christmas Bird Count is run by the National Audubon Society. Well, the Great Backyard Bird Count is actually run by Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the National Audubon Society, and Birds Canada. Now, there's sponsors who really do promote the bird count. They help it out. But those are the three main organizations that are running the Great Backyard Bird Count. Now, they have done a lot with this data. They're collecting a lot of data every single year. For instance, last year in 2022, there were 7,099 species of birds identified during the bird count. 192 countries participated in this. So it's not just in the United States. This is all over the world that people are participating in the Great Backyard Bird Count. That's awesome. 384,641 estimated global participants. People taking part, counting birds. Can you imagine having 384,641 people in your neighborhood counting the bird? Probably don't even have that many people in your neighborhood. That's a lot of people counting birds on one weekend. Boy, this is amazing. How do you participate? Hopefully I've gotten you excited and made you understand why you should participate. Oh, maybe you don't know why you should participate. I mean, I explained why we do citizen science, why we have this bird count, why we have other bird counts. It helps scientists, but why on earth would you want to participate? Hey, do you want your neighborhood to be represented? Do you want to have fun for a weekend? There's just so many reasons to participate. Plus, you're helping science, helping them discover new things, helping them collect data. Big reason for a lot of people is it's fun. It's a lot of fun to do. And they want their neighborhoods represented. So I hope you want yours represented too. And you may be thinking, well, my neighbor does it so I don't have to. No, the more people, the better. 
Wouldn't it be great if we had 30 people in your neighborhood participating in this? Every one of them is collecting data in their backyard, in their area. That gets the entire area counted. Makes it so much better and so much easier. So once you decide, which I hope you already have, once you decide that, yes, I'm going to participate, make sure you tell all your friends and get them to participate as well. Maybe have a party at your house one of the days and say, okay, we're going to count birds. Have a birding party. That would be awesome. Anyhow, how do you participate? Remember I said at the beginning, four days, 24 hours a day? No, you don't have to do it the entire time. You get to decide when you want to watch the birds. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to decide where you're going to watch birds. And do this ahead of time. Maybe you're going to do it in your yard, but you don't have any bird feeders. Now's a good time to get some. You should always have bird feeders. I won't get into why you should have bird feeders because this is a half-hour podcast, but it's fun to watch the birds. I'll just leave it there. So decide where you want to watch the birds. Maybe you don't get a lot of birds in your yard. Maybe you always see birds at a local park you go hiking at. That's where you want to go and watch the birds. So head to that park. The second step. All you need to do is you need to watch the birds for 15 minutes or more, at least once over the four days. Once again, February 17th through the 20th, it is Friday through Monday. So maybe you got a busy weekend. Okay, you got a football game to watch on Sunday. You have something else to do on Saturday. Uh, Friday, you're working. You're going out for dinner after work. And it's like the only day you have available is Monday, President's Day. You have the day off. Okay, perfect. I have nothing to do. There's your one day. That's fine. Maybe you're available for 15 minutes or more each and every day. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. You decide when you're available. But maybe it's like, okay, I've got this to do in the morning, and then I've got five minutes before I have to head out to do another errand. And Do you have time? No. 15 minutes or more. Not just five, not just 10, 15 minutes or more. That's the protocol for this. So if you can find 15 minutes to watch the birds, you've got it made. If you have more time, all the better. So it's not saying that, okay, you can only watch for 15 minutes. It has to be exactly 15 minutes. No, don't go out and grab a stopwatch. Just make sure you can watch at least 15 minutes. At least one of the days over that four-day period. Sorry to harp on this, but usually when I'm talking about the Great Backyard Bird Count, I explain how easy it is. I always get someone who just doesn't get the whole 15 minutes one day. You want to do it more? Awesome. The more, the better. Usually, most years, I try to keep that weekend fairly open, but I do get busy. I will do it at least three days out of the four. And I will do it for at least 15 minutes each of those days. Now, sometimes I will be available like Saturday morning. I'll count the birds for half an hour. Then I'll do it Saturday afternoon. I'll count the birds for an hour. And then Sunday, I will count the birds for 15 minutes in the morning. So I spread it out. That way, I can get more counts in. And maybe that robin that was hanging out in the woods is only there on Saturday, and I don't see him the rest of the days. That way, you get a more accurate feeling for who's in your neighborhood by counting more than just one day. But if you can only do 15 minutes one day, that's fine. Now, the next step, you need to identify All the birds that you see or hear within your plans, time, location, and use the best tool 
for sharing your bird sightings. First, decide where you watch where you want to watch the birds. Second, count the birds for 15 minutes or more at least once over the four-day period. And then you need to identify the birds. This is where everyone panics. It's like, oh no, I don't know my birds. I can't figure it out. I don't want to sit there with my field guide all weekend long trying to figure out what birds are what birds. There's sources out there, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. So you need to either see the bird or hear the bird. I've got friends who are awesome at identifying birds by sound. I'm pretty good at it. I don't know them all, but I know most of them. But if you're just sitting inside watching out your window because you've got snow on the ground and it's 20 degrees outside, you're not going to be listening for the birds. You're going to be watching them. Okay, there's a couple of tools that you can use that will help you not just identify birds, but will also help you record them. Remember, we got to get all this data to the scientists. So we need a way to get them into the database. Now, I remember when I first started doing the Great Backyard Bird Count many years ago, everything was online. You had to fill out a form. You had to submit all your data. It's so much easier now. There's two ways to submit data. And both of them will also help you identify birds. Now, the first one is the Merlin Bird ID app. Merlin, as in Merlin the magician, or I think he was a wizard. Uh, M-E-R-L-I-N, Merlin Bird ID. Look it up on your app store. Download it onto your phone. Make sure you do this before the bird count. And check it out. Play with it a little bit. This is one of my favorites because when I'm bird banding, when I'm doing summer maps bird banding, I actually use the Merlin app quite often because I'll be wandering through the woods and I'm listening for the birds while I'm doing bird banding because part of the data collection is what I hear as well as what I see and what I capture in the nets and bands. We want to know a full count of what's in the area. And all the birds are not going to come into the nets. So we're listening also. I don't know all the birds. And some of them, I'm concentrating on that cardinal or that blue jay that I'm listening to. And I may miss one of the warblers that's deeper into the woods. So I have the Merlin app open on my phone, recording all the sounds around me. And it picks up the different calls of the birds and it identifies them. So this is an awesome tool if you really have trouble identifying birds, especially by sound. Use the Merlin Bird ID app. It listens for you. Now, you can also put into the Merlin app, okay, it was a small red bird, looked like, and, and what it's going to do is it's going to narrow it down. It's going to help you to figure out what bird you are seeing. Now, the other one that I like, and this is what I usually use to record all my sightings during the Great Backyard Bird Count, it's called eBird. E is an Edward, B I R D, eBird, eBird mobile app, or there's an eBird website if you don't like to have a whole bunch of apps on your phone. Trust me, you'll love this app. You'll want it on your phone. The eBird mobile app or the eBird website. That's how I record the birds. So those are the two best ways to identify birds and to enter your data. So what if you're not good and you're thinking you're not able, you're not, you know, good enough to do this? I'm an amateur. I don't know how to identify birds. I'm new to birding. Don't panic. Use these two apps. There's also a lot of good material out there. Some of the really good bird IDs that I use. Once again, I'm going to talk about apps here. First of all, eBird and Merlin, of course. But Audubon Bird Guide 
the Audubon Bird Guide app is wonderful. I used to use a different one many years ago, but then they started charging me for it. And I just didn't feel it was that good. And I found the Audubon Bird Guide app and I thought, well, this is even better than the one I was using. It will help identify birds or just get a really good field guide. Oh, book. Do people really use books anymore? I'm actually in my office recording this. I'm looking over at my shelf and I've got about, oh, looks like about 25 different field guides up there. Not all birds. I think I have like four or five. Yeah, I've got about six different bird field guides. I still use books now and then. Usually not when I'm in the field. Then I just use my phone for identification. There's a lot of different methods. What if you're the type that I don't want to be right on the spot trying to identify the birds? What can I do? On the Great Backyard Bird Count website, bird count, all one word, birdcount.org. It's not .com, it's an O-R-G. So birdcount.org. If you go to that website, do a lot of research on it, Look it over. There's so much information out there. They just rebuilt their website not too long ago, and it, I was just blown away. It's just beautiful now. It is awesome, easy to use, so informative. There's there's information for everybody on there and how to do this bird count. So I really recommend going there after you listen to the podcast, of course. Let me finish up here. Then you can go there and really get in depth with the website. But anyhow, on the website, they have what's called eBird Academy course. That teaches you how to use eBird. And I, even though I've been using eBird for years, I did the course not too long ago just to see what it was like. And it was, was very informative. It really does help out. And I thought to myself, it's like, yeah, if you've never used eBird before, if you're not big with birding apps, you need to watch this because it really is helpful. It's very informative. It shows you how to use eBird and it's user-friendly, really user-friendly. They also have other courses on the website for bird identification. Now, another thing I want to talk about with bird ID, besides the courses without some of these apps, Look at the Audubon website, okay? The National Audubon Society, on their website, they have a lot of information about birds. Just skim through it. See which ones are in your area, the most common birds in your area, and get to know them by picture, information about them. There's also allaboutbirds.org. That's another awesome website. They'll give you a lot of information about identification of birds. Uh, of course, birdcount.org has a lot of information as well. Check out YouTube videos on bird identification in wherever you live. I'm not going to say eastern U.S. That's where I live. But if you live out in the western United States or you live in South America, go on YouTube, Birds of South America. I'm actually planning a trip to South America coming up soon. And that's one thing I did is I looked at Birds of South America because I love birding, especially when I'm at new places. Check out YouTube videos, Audubon's website, all about birds. All the words are connected there. Allaboutbirds.org, birdcount.org, field guides, the eBird Academy course, other bird ID courses on the birdcount.org website. All of these will help you with identifying the birds. And I always recommend start learning early. That way you get to know the birds in your backyard. And then when you have a bird count like this, it makes it so much easier. Now, there's some other really interesting things about the Great Backyard Bird Count. Maybe you enjoy taking pictures of wildlife, taking pictures of birds. Almost all of the photographs on the website for the Great Backyard Bird Count are taken by 
participants of the bird count. So if you take pictures, they have a section on their website for submitting your photographs. And maybe you could be on their site as well, one of your photographs. Now, I'm actually going to go to the website here because I want to talk you through some of it because it's a very informative website. It's an awesome website. Once again, it's birdcount.org, birdcount.org. If you go to the website, the very first thing that's going to come up is information about it. You can join a webinar on February 15th from 1 to 2 p.m. They have a webinar going on. Uh, connect to birds, to nature, with each other. They talk about how to participate. They talk about what the bird counts about. There's several pull-down menus. There's an about menu, which tells you how to explore local results. You can see what other birds are being found in your area. They have spread the word, share your experience, birding for everyone, uh, under help, it tells you all about frequently asked questions. There's a participate button, and they go through exactly what I told you, how to participate. And then they also have a section on the how to participate button on how to enter your data and the three ways to enter your data, which is, once again, using the Merlin Bird ID app or the eBird app or if you don't have a phone or you hate using your phone, then go on the desktop computer or your laptop and use the eBird website. All of those are ways to do it. Now, another interesting thing that they have on here is you can actually download a checklist of birds. Maybe ahead of time, go through that checklist, cross off the ones that you won't find in your neck of the woods, and that way it'll make it much easier for you. So all these things are found right on the Great Backyard Bird Count website. So I hope I encouraged you to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. I mean, this is an awesome, fun thing to do. I love doing it every year. I look forward to it every year. I get a little disappointed if I don't have a lot of time to participate. But once again, it's easy if you don't. 15 minutes or more. One day or more. So if you can only have 15 minutes on one day this weekend, hey, you're set. Once again, doesn't take a lot of time. All you need to do is have a little bit of time, a little bit of knowledge of the birds. Maybe you want to take pictures of the birds and look them up later to figure out what birds they were and then go on your eBird app. Now, the neat thing about the eBird app I forgot to mention is it'll actually start a timer. So it tells how long you've been watching the birds, counting the birds, and it puts together your list for you. And then you just turn it off when you are done counting the birds and it submits the data immediately for you. It's all done. So I hope I encouraged you to participate. Please help the scientists. And by doing it, you're going to have a lot of fun too. Well, that's about all I've got to say about the Great Back Air Bird Count. I hope I gave you enough information to make you realize it's easy to do, it's fun to do, and it really does help scientists. I hope you enjoyed wandering through nature with me today. Don't forget to invite your nature-loving friends to join us. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button or the follow button and take a minute to rate and review the podcast, please. If you have any nature questions or ideas for future episodes, please feel free to drop me a DM on my Instagram page at the nature wanderer underscores in between each one of the words, or go to my website at naturewanderer.org. You can also support the podcast by joining my Patreon, which will also give you extras, including videos, education classes, pictures, and much more. You can also show your support of the podcast and your love of nature by wearing a Nature Wanderer t-shirt or maybe drinking out of a Nature Wanderer water bottle. Or We have backpacks, puzzles, and much more which can be purchased at my store, which is linked in the show notes and from my website. 
Have a great week and keep exploring the nature around you. Happy birding, everyone.